Welcome to Tea Time History Chat with me, Philippa Lacey Brule. Today we are talking books because I know most of you are bibliophiles like me and are probably looking at what your next investment in a book is going to be. As someone said to me yesterday, they cost money and it's really good to have a discussion about what books you're going to buy um, so that you can get the ones that you're going to enjoy the most, hopefully learn the most from. And if you, uh, well, the books we're going to go through today are actually the candidates for Book Club 2024. So if you're also interested in actually discussing books with like-minded people, then um, then you might be interested to see what books might be making it into Book Club for 2024. And then you can decide whether to join if you haven't already. Maria, hi, welcome. I'm streaming live on Instagram, YouTube and Facebook. And of course, I'm always grateful if you support me in those just by watching, liking, sticking hearts on the screen on Instagram. I think it's a thumbs up on YouTube and Facebook. I really should find out, but I haven't, as you can probably tell every time I talk about Facebook. But you can support me also with badges on Instagram, stars on Facebook, super chats on YouTube. But what I would really like for you to do is come and join my Patreon. It's patreon.com forward slash British History. Book Club is in there and as well as loads of other things, which does mean that I can give back as well. So hi, welcome. We've got Nicholas, Deverid. Um, I've got lots of people. Um, I should put my Brianna is, is over on YouTube. Welcome. So who is ready to talk books because um, I have a few to go through. You may have seen my post. Um, I'll be posting a bit more about them later. But we've got 15 to go through. In fact, I, I also have a few Bobby bonuses. It was so difficult to even come up with the long list, even come up with the long list. So let's go. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, I am interested also, actually, if you are, if you are reading a good book, Fiction or non-fiction, actually. All the ones I'm going to go through today are non-fiction. Um, however, I am looking for some um, fiction books to read as well. So Amy says she's currently reading a true story. That, oh, gosh, The Last Hours in Paris set during the Holocaust. I bet that is harrowing. Um, Maria, really enjoying Leander's book. Finished chapter three last night. The font is rather tiny. Yes, don't eat, don't uh, 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 be reading it too late. Colleen, hey in California, how are you doing? Uh, Linda in Michigan, rainy. Yeah, we've got the rain too. I think autumn is right. I'm saying autumn set in. I thought autumn had set in before the last tour, and clearly we had a heat wave. And apparently, we might be having another one, but I don't know. Um, Nicholas. I love British history because my late grandfather was Angus Montague, the 12th Duke of Manchester. Well, good for him. Um, so Leander's book, I'll just mention it because um, Maria just mentioned it. This is actually the book we're looking at in Book Club at the moment. So we're just starting this one, The Sisters Who Would Be Queen um, by Leander Delisle. We are having a book club meeting on the 12th of November. So if you are interested in um, discussing this book you've got time to 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 join us again patreon.com forward slash british history oh and i should say um also welcome to the people listening on the podcast which you can do i upload this as soon as i can after i finish the live stream so that it goes over to the podcast <clears throat> but anyway back to the sisters who would be queen so this is about the gray sisters obviously we know the story of jane or at least we've we, everyone would have heard the story of jane gray um, but she had two sisters, uh, Catherine and Mary. And of course, if Jane is in the line of succession, then so are Catherine and Mary. So, um, so probably, um, so sorry. So it's interesting to see what happens to them in their lives. Um, it is very insightful, I think, into... Elizabeth I and her actions and her actions around the succession. Um, I and um, I, there's somebody um, who was saying in Patreon actually I think it was Marie Maria excuse me who said um, 
it's given her a different angle, changed her view perhaps on Elizabeth I. And I think that's probably what this book did mostly for me as well. Catherine is asking, hi Catherine, how are you? Uh, is this the regular time for a Wednesday now? Yes, I've moved it back to three o'clock UK time because it seemed to suit more people in general. So, um, so yes. So uh, at the moment, yes, yes, we're sticking with it. So anyway, so this isn't one of the ones I was going to talk about today, but this is the book that we are, sorry, Instagram, it's a bit blurry. Um, this is the book that we are going to be discussing in book club on the 12th of November. So we'd love to see you. Um, we'd love to see you all there. There's quite a few of us here today who are in our own book club. So so please do join patreon.com forward slash British history. It's five pounds a month and you can cancel any time. There's no hard feelings. I understand people's uh, lives and restrictions and everything. So, right. First of all, I'll have a cup of tea and then we'll get started. We'll get started with um, one that's been re a book that's been renamed. I don't think it should have been. And I don't think the writer thinks it should have been either started it's a short one Elfrida now this is actually a book about an Anglo-Saxon queen called Elfrith and it's been renamed renamed Elfrida um oh Lottie Rose thank you so much for the badge Lottie has just um supported me with a badge on Instagram very much appreciated thank you um Elizabeth Norton has written the book and if you look on my YouTube channel there is actually an interview with Elizabeth about this book and um, I will share the link to it afterwards in fact quite a few of the books I have interviewed the authors so I will do my best to share all of those later um, and yes yeah, so so oh, Elfrith renamed here Elfrida because it was thought that I'm sorry American that you can't manage the name Elfrith. Um, I don't particularly like the practice of renaming people because it's a little bit difficult to pronounce their names. I mean, I'm, I think as well, once you get used to it, you, you know, you, you're used to it. It's like Alfred, that's the same. Um, so Alfred is a, an old English name, you know, an Anglo-Saxon name. So it's that same beginning, Elfrid, Linda, those darn Americans. <laughs> and also, I think you can cope. I think this is fun. I think you can manage Elfrid. Um, Personally, I would have been more drawn to, to anyway, to the book. Um, so she, um, she was actually the first crowned Queen of England. Her and her husband, let me just check, yeah, yes, Edgar, Edgar, were um, crowned at Bath in 973. So um, I know, Colleen, of course, you, I know. It's what we can't pronounce it. Of course, you, uh, exactly, exactly. If you can say Alfred, you can say Elfred. It's, it's, and once you see it written down as well, I think it's uh, a little bit more, um, e you know, it, it's easier then to, uh, to envisage. And actually, uh, as I was reading it, I was in my mind, just couldn't say Elfrida. Anyway, I had to change them all to Elfrith. Um, anyway, so it's, it's a fairly short book, um, necessi you know, necessitated by how much information is actually out there about uh, about Elfrith. So you're talking less than 200 pages. So this is, um, like I said, all the ones that we're going through today are candidates for the books in book club next year. And I would personally like to see this one in here. Oh, I'm saying this. <laughs> the reason the list is set is 15 books long and I had to stop myself at 15 is because I couldn't choose. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but anyway, even if it doesn't make it in, have a little have a little look yourself. I've just thought of, oh no, dude. I was going to say, I just thought of another one that I would really wish to be in there. I've chosen over um, a range of, different eras not all eras are covered but I tell you what this year in book club has gone through gone past so quickly that I feel like it's fine because we'll get we'll get before we know it we'll be choosing the ones for 2025 20, as well 
So anyway, so that's Elfrida. Sticking with the Anglo-Saxons, I know a few of you are fascinated by this as well. And if you're not, um, maybe, maybe I can do something to, to pique your interest. Anglo-Saxon England, well, the Anglo-Saxon period, so it's between the Romans leaving, also love, I haven't got any Roman books, I don't think. Oh, no, I have. Um, in between the Romans leaving um, and and the, the Norman conquest, we have the, well, we have the period of the Anglo-Saxons. But this is the period where um, England is a, is a number of smaller kingdoms and principalities, and it by the time William the Conqueror comes uh, in 1066, it is in the land of the Engles, Engerland, England. So um, it's the formation of the country which William the Conqueror then can come and conquer. <laughs> Got a conquer tree in my uh, garden. I think it's different. So. Uh, Maria, <laughs> Maria, Maria knows me already. Anyway, so yes, yeah, she's just guessing what the what the one will be. So the Anglo Saxons by Mark Morris is a is a great book taking us through that period, the formation of England, um, and um, it, it's there's actually an incredible amount of information. What it makes you realise is actually. How much we do know now it's there's less left in um there's left 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 in physical sites and lottie rose is saying i wish there was more historical sites left because romans built in stone the normans built in stone the anglo-saxons um built more in wood they're incredibly environmentally friendly uh and so we don't have as much left we do have places like Deerhurst Priory. Uh, well, some of the priories and abbeys were actually um, uh, some of the older ones were created during. Oh, because this is also the period where Christianity comes to the country as well. This is the move from paganism to Christianity as well. Um, so we do have the the beginnings of um, churches and um, and monastic institutions. Um, so we get we have a little bit left, um, if you know where to look. There is, and I did this for Patreon, I think. Um, yes, I think it was after I set up the Patreon. So I did this for Patreon where I went over to Deerhurst, and there's Deerhurst Priory, and right next next to it, well within a very short walking distance, is a place called called Odders Chapel. Um, so, but anyway, so we have a few few sort of physical sites. Um, I tell you what, though, their I think their jewellery was a cut above Roman or or Norman jewellery. So it, this is the period as well that that was termed the Dark Ages for a little while. Now that that term was coined by a um, a Roman or Italian uh, historian. I can't remember in which period. Um, I think he might have been a little bit biased because, of course, he was talking about when uh, the period after the Romans had left. But we did lose things. Underfloor heating, that never came back. Um, and uh, really good municipal spas, they never came back. So we, we did get bath after a certain while. Um, but anyway, so, so this book is um, particularly cool. It's also on Audible as well, so if anyone's interested in listening to it. I um, haven't managed to interview Mark Morris yet. That would be that would be a coup. I would enjoy that very much. Um, this book I have spoken about more recently, and I've um, I've rubbed the gold lettering off by by handling it so much. There's a bit of a debate. Uh, where did I see it about how people interact with their books? I was used to be because I learned this from my dad. I was used to be someone who tried to keep a book very pristine. I would never write on a book. And it would make me feel very icky if I had to turn down a page. And then I did an extra open university course anyway. And the first module was all about interacting with books and writing all over them. I actually think it's a great um, compliment 
if you are so into your book that you are turning down pages for things that you want to look at again and you're making notes and you're underlining things. Anyway, Nicola's book. I don't think, I don't, I think, was it Nicola saying she doesn't do this? And I'm like, oh, okay, don't show what I've done to her book. Anyway, so this is written by uh, Dr. Nicola Tallis. It's called The Uncrowned Queen. And it's the, uh, the Fateful Life of Margaret Beaufort. So it is about Margaret Beaufort. Um, and it is a really, really good biography of her. It challenges some um, of the, um, the, well, it certainly challenges how Margaret is put across in popular fiction. Um, that's who tries to keep her books pristine, but takes them on trains. Just relax into it, relax into it. They're books, they should be handled. The only thing is on hardbacks, I like to take the, um, I like to take the sleeve off because otherwise they do get very dog-eared. Um, but anyway, sorry, back to Nicola's book. She, um, um, yes, yeah, so she goes into Margaret's story. She, so you get to hear far more about the person, the woman she actually was, and you see how um, uh, how she develops as a person. You know, a person isn't a person. We can sometimes, excuse me, we can sometimes look back. I, I think, um, I have been um, guilty of this as well. And think, oh, that person, well, they were they were X, Y, and Z. They were like this, like that, or like the other. You know, we know what their personality was. Well, of course, we're either looking at a snapshot of them at one particular point in their life, or maybe a sort of synopsis of their life, a, 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 an amalgamated conclusion. And of course, no, no humans like that. Um, I should hope, I should hope we all develop <laughs> over our lives. Margaret gets hit with tragedy after tragedy and to see how she copes, to see how she develops, um, uh, it's just, it's incredibly interesting. Now I have um, interviewed Nicola Tallis and she will be, at that, sorry, excuse me, that interview will be available in October. So um, to patrons, you get it the week before and you of course get the extended ad free version where I put, Nicola your questions um for anyone who's not a patron already that's one of the bonus uh, one of the, yeah, one of the features of being a patron is you can ask your own questions you can put them put forward your own questions for people I'm interviewing but anyway so that's going to go um live in October to be able to see that Nicola is also um just as yesterday confirmed we'll be talking on the rise of the Tudors tour next September so September 2024 because I want to I wanted to come and talk about Margaret and her role in that Tudor in the Tudor dynasty even coming to pass in the first place and then how she supported it um right the way through to her her, her own death but anyway so Nicola's book is in the long list for um for book club 2024 i'm gonna right these are not going to be in chronological order that doesn't matter millicent thank you very much for my triple badge that is incredibly great um generous thank you so much um oh look i have post-its in this one uh the greatest night by thomas ashbridge another man i would like to speak to he is, uh, writes about The Greatest Night. So this is William Marshall. And um, so he, he, well, you might have heard of William Marshall with the story of King John and, um, and his son, Henry III, wasn't he? <laughs> Just as my mind's gone blank. Um, so he, he, um, he he supported the re the um hmm, re issuing I think I was reissuing of Magna Carta in um uh, in twelve seventeen which meant that it it survived um so he he's known for that but he actually served five different kings and he he is um if hmm, if any of you watched the Last Kingdom and the Uhtred character in that who is just loyal. He's very, very loyal. Whoever he is 
um, uh, um, I was going to say fighting for, but um, sort of whoever his master is at the time, he is incredibly loyal. And William Marshall is like that. William Marshall also, he lives, he's the greatest knight, but the whole concept of knighthood, of, of knights and chivalry, um, even the um, the creation of banners and heraldry comes about during the lifetime of William Marshall and how he goes about um, sort of making a living to begin with and then... Um, and then serving his masters and uh, building up his own kind of, um, I would say wealth, but it's more like his security um, is, is absolutely fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. And of course, because he is living through the beginnings of chivalry, the beginnings of what it means to, uh, I mean, they had, um, there was no such thing as a, um, a joust sort of thing at the time they would have these incredibly violent tournaments um, where you would capture someone and you could, if you captured them, you could take their horse, you could take their armour, you could take their horse armour, you could take their weapons. That was your prize. And um, so, you know, he built up his wealth by being just incredibly good at doing that kind of thing. So um, William Marshall basically The Greatest Night uh, by Thomas Ash Ashbridge. Um, the Remarkable Life of William Marshall, The Power Behind Five English Thrones. It's his full title. So I, I fancy that as well. There's, there's not one book actually in this list that I wouldn't be very happy for, uh, for it to be uh, chosen. Okay, we're going forward a little bit. Yeah, a little bit. Two... The Red Prince, John of Gaunt. So you'll notice I've picked some books this time. Um, well, I suppose last time as well, but figures that we see on slightly on the outskirts of the stories of the monarchs because they are not the only story. They're not the only story in town. They're not the only... So anyway, John of Gaunt, The Red Prince, uh, Duke of Lancaster. This is by Helen Carr, Lottie Rose. She says, I love this one. It's great. This one is also on Audible. Um, I don't know about Uncrowned Queen and the Greatest Night. I have to check, but I do know that The Red Prince is on Audible. Again, you can see my interview with Helen on my YouTube channel. So I will um, endeavour to remember to share that link later. Um, so, I mean, John of Gaunt is... So he he's someone who you will have heard of, I imagine. Um He's far more central to uh, to the um, the fifteenth century than, than than you would have perhaps um, <laughs> you would have perhaps uh, realized. I, even down to things like Kenilworth Castle was uh, one of his. So he is um, you know, he was the architect. If you think about Kenilworth Castle, we, we've spoken about it a lot in terms of John uh, John Dudley. No, in terms of Robert Dudley. Um, but John of Gaunt um, uh, builds there. I'm pretty sure that he owns Tutbury Castle. I'd have to check that. I think he owned Tutbury Castle. And I think Blanche of Lancaster gave birth there, perhaps died there. Um, so again, I mean, his, his palace was the Savoy Palace in London. And you may have heard of the Savoy Hotel. That's on the site of the Savoy Palace. That was his palace. And um, during the um, the uprising, was it the Peasants' Revolt? Yeah, the Peasants' Revolt. Um, he, uh, it's interesting. Like, this book is so interesting because, so John of Gaunt was a man who suffered under propaganda and um, so, so, and he and he did suffer for it. His reputation suffered for it, but he suffered for it in in physical and and financial terms as well. Because he was not in London during the Peasants' Revolt, and they went to London, and they um, they got into his into his home and um, and and burnt it. Now there was actually an accident 
which meant that it was blown up, um, which is in the book. It's also, we also talk about it in the interview with Helen. So I'll leave that as a bit of a, a surprise. It's, um, I don't know if I can call it a fun story, but it is quite a fun story. So anyway, I'll leave that to, to you for a bit of a surprise. But anyway, so that's The Red Prince, John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster by Helen Carr. So your favourites so far? This, what have we done so far? Elf Breeder, Empress, uh, by Elizabeth Norton. Anglis, the Anglo Saxons by Mark Morris. Uncrowned Queen, which is the story of Margaret Beaufort by Nicola Tallis. The Greatest Night, which is a uh, story of William Marshall by Thomas Ashbridge. And The Red Prince, which is John of Gaunt by Helen Carr. Five down, ten to go. Are you making notes, everybody? Are you, uh, are you, or are you just going to, are you going to think? See, all these books that um, we were having a discussion yesterday, me and um, 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 Marie, and uh, yeah, about they cost money. So, um Oh, Linda says Red Prince is on Apple Books if you're a Kindle person. Oh. As you can see, I have an Audible and a oh, physical book problem. Uh, Jenna's got her Christmas list started. Um, Lottie Rose, have they changed Saxon, Saxon names all the way through the Elsfrith book? That's a very good question. I can't remember. Um, some of them slightly, just to make them easier to um to pronounce in their correct way so i've got a feeling that edgar would be written if it was written in the old way it'd be um e-a-d-g-a-r so they've taken out that second a so it just reads e-d-g-a-r um and alfred for instance would have been actually written down a-e-l-f-r-e-d so they've taken the e out of that so you kind of get the um, correct pronunciation because of that. However, with Elfrith's name, they've just changed it. Um, <laughs> me is painted by Holbein. Well, that would have been nice. Is Edith a derivation? Elfrith, Edith, maybe, yeah. So, yeah, I think it was. A, that was a, um, an old English name. Edward is an old English name. Um, because when, um, when Henry the, oh, hang on, where am I? When Henry the, no, Edward II, no, Henry II names his firstborn Edward. It's a little bit like, oh, that's a, not a French name. <laughs> that's an English name. Do you know? But it, he was... Um, he was a big fan of Edward the Confessor. Anyway, that's a bit of a tangent. Okay, so the last book that we discussed in book club was Houses of Power by Simon Thurley. And in the meeting, someone said, excuse me, because I can't remember off the top of my head who this was now, uh, said it would be so good if um, if we'd written a book about like what happens next and the, the House of the Stuarts. And I was like, oh, he has. So palaces of, Revo palaces of Revolution, Life, Death and Art at the Stuart Court by Simon Thurley is the next book. So this would be a good follow on from Houses of Power by Simon Thurley as well. Um, and it, like with Houses of Power, it gives us insight into the way the court works by how the buildings were used. Um, it starts off with a fascinating chapter, I thought it was fascinating, about the um, differences between the Scottish court and the English court and how that impacted, what, what, the, what that looked like when James VI of Scotland becomes James I of England also, and also his first, um, it's almost progress really, down from Scotland to London, he takes his time. He has a ball. He goes to various different places, some of courtiers, um, I think some of what would be his own palaces. Um, but you get incredibly interesting, um, uh, this is also on Audible, by the way, but of course with any book like this, 
it's great to get the actual book because you've got things like plans of um, of places. But for instance, when you realise what a dilapidated state the Tower of London was in, because when James gets there, there's tarpaulin or whatever the um, early, uh, uh, where are we now? Early 17th century version of tarpaulin is, um, is over the Great Hall, the Great Hall that we've now lost, the Great Hall where Anne Boleyn was tried, um, where Henry VIII had hosted a, a banquet for her um, on the eve of her coronation procession. Uh, Marie says, Simon Thurley want, please, look how this one goes straight into the top five, pretty please, <laughs> with a bow on top. Also, Pax too, we'll get to Pax in a minute, yeah. Um, it would be a great follow on. It's a, it's great for standalone as well. You know, you can pick this up. You don't have to have read Houses of Power. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's good. It's very good. So sticking, uh, well, going backwards a little bit. Let me introduce you, if you don't already have this, to Tudor, The Family Story by Leanza Delisle. Um, Leander picks up things in her book that I hadn't heard before or that hadn't been emphasised before. Um, for example, um, what happened to Owen Tudor. Um, for quite a while, he lived, He because he marries Catherine um, of Valois, they have two children. Uh, Jasper and um, and uh, Edmund um, and anyway, so there's a whole, there's the whole sort of um, origins of the, the Tudors, the Tudors, and what's very interesting, if I can, I I wonder if I can uh, pick it out, is how their name wasn't actually Tudor. It was Tudor, but that was part of the name. Oh, goodness, would I be able to find it? Um, and um, she talks about uh, where Owen Tudor was when Catherine of Valois was buried. You know, he was a nobody. He was um, he was just, he was not um, invited to the funeral. He had to watch from the crowds. Um, but yes, his, the actual Welsh name, well, I don't know if I'll be able to find it just uh, while I'm, uh, re, uh, while I'm talking to you as well, but it's it's something 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 Tudor, up uh, Tudor. So the so so it was shortened by the English basically to Tudor, so that it was uh, pronounceable, pronounceable, pronounceable. And um, so yes, so that was interesting as well. Just just from the get go that the Tudors. That's only part of the actual name. Um, uh, Melanie says, I've heard Tudor is Welsh for Theodore. Is that correct? Um, I don't I don't think so because the Tudor name was just in there. I, if I could find it, I probably couldn't pronounce it for you anyway. But it was basically part of a much longer name. <laughs> uh, so it's something at Tudor. Because it, it, they're named son of, son of, son of. And, and the and the, the the surnames were, were built up like that, as far as I understand. Um, and actually, Tudor was used by Richard III and and people who were um, wishing to draw attention to the the low bornness of the Tudor name. Um, Henry. The seventh Henry Tudor doesn't refer to himself as Henry Tudor. He refers to himself as Richmond, which was his title. Um, Tudor was used as a disparaging name, so it's very interesting. That that's the one that that comes down to us, um, and that sticks. I mean, we're doing um, an online history festival um, on the seventeenth till the nineteenth of November called the Tudors. <laughs> Just the Tudors. It's the Tudors. Um, if you want tickets for that, by the way, you can go to the Tudors 2023 on Eventbrite. Um, so it's the, the Tudors 2023 
www.eventbrite.co.uk. So you can get your tickets for that right now. But anyway, so the family story, um, Tudor, the family story, excuse me, by Leander Delisle is also a candidate for Book Club 2024. Um, as is, we'll stick with the Tudors for a minute, as is Thomas Penn's book, The Winter King, about um, Henry VII. So he's called it The Dawn of Tudor England. And I... Um, you can actually watch Thomas Penn do um, do a series. There was a series based on his book, and it I found it very interesting, very compelling. Gives a um, b b before we had like Joanne Paul's book on the House of Dudley, which which gives you quite a in depth look at Henry the Seventh. I don't think we really had many books that looked at Henry the Seventh particularly before before this. So, um, so anyway, so I I I really enjoyed this book, um, and I think it's because he's um, he was a fairly new writer, me at the time. Um, it was different different viewpoint, but it gives um, yeah a very detailed look at, at Henry the Seventh. Um, what else have we got? My phone is doing a whole like going going low. If I go off Instagram, please join me. That's yeah, please join me on YouTube or Facebook. Okay, so um this one I definitely know is on Audible because I've been listening to it on Audible. The Restless Republic by Anna Key. Um sorry, Catherine, sorry to be slow on the uptake, but are these all books for book club or do they get voted for? Yes, so no, that so these this is the long list. Oh, Jenna said, sorry, she has watched the series The Winter King. It's a fascinating documentary. I think so, too. I think it's really good. So we're going through 15 books. This is the long list for book club. Um, but I thought everyone might be interested to, whether you're in book club or not, but might be interested in um, in me going through them because I know people like to, you know, you if you're like me, you're always looking for your next history read. And, you know, books are an investment. So, um so I thought it'd be useful to talk about. If you're in Patreon, uh, or you want to be, and of course you're very, very welcome, we would love you to be there, um, the vote on which books you would like to see in Book Club 2024 goes live after I finish this today. So you can go over to patreon.com forward slash British History and just pick your favourites. And then I'm going to rank them and the top five or six, when I've worked out how many dates we can fit in, um, will, will um, be chosen. And they'll go forward. So one of them is The Restless Republic by Anna Key. You might like to put a pause in the middle of her first and last name for obvious reasons. And this is about what it was what was going on what was it like in britain britain as it would become um during the republic era so the interregnum we can only call it an interregnum afterwards when we know it was over this 11 years when parliament took over and we had abolished the monarchy oh my goodness me I actually think this should be, um, I would go so far to say that I think every uh, British person, English person should read this. Anyone who's interested in, and, and anyone who's interested to see what happens when one regime tries to abolish another and take over. Absolutely fascinating what happens after because there are people on the same side, in inverted commas, who are after getting rid of the um, the monarchy and all that it supposedly stands for. So, you know, all the ills are down to the fact we have a monarchy. Now, Charles I had his short shortcomings, absolutely. But there were people united around the idea of getting rid of the monarchy the specifics of what they thought it would look like after that monarchy had been abolished and also many of them were not thinking they meant to kill the king um 
but and if you're interested in a talk from that julian humphreys did one in the stewart's online history festival which you can still get hold of the talks um uh, as an add-on to your ticket for the tudors online history festival or you can buy it as a standalone on buymeacoffee.com forward slash philippa b um yeah so most of it, lots of them didn't they didn't think they were going to kill the king so that's very interesting um but afterwards, you know, this for some of them, this is like people like the levelers, this was supposed to be a chance to turn turn the, the societal hierarchy on its head. This was a chance to relook at the way um everything was set up. Um it is it's so Lottie Rose is saying it's such a fascinating thing to explore. It's applicable to so many other situations too, like current political events and entanglements right now. It really is. It really, really is. Um you had people like I think this is supposed is this supposed to be um yeah, probably the front is supposed to be um I and I spoke about these, the diggers. Um oh, actually that might be pulling down the tree, looks like it might be representing the crown actually. But there was there was so there was the levelers who were who who were were petitioning for um, a a leveling of opportunity um, you know things like that and, and to get rid of um, sort of uh, inherited privilege. Uh, well, it's very it's it's it fascinating to see what happened. Did that go? Hmm. Not when Cromwell decides that Hampton Court Palace is his weekend home. Um, you had people like the Diggers, who I spoke about on um, on this, uh, and you can go back on my YouTube channel and have a look. I think I did title the that that um, that Tea Time Live about. Uh, I think I did title it the Diggers, who who sort who wanted to grow their own food. In fact, create community gardens out of um out of land that wasn't being used <clears throat> so common land was common land um and they wanted to to grow food the, the country was starving <laughs> there were people starving um and they wanted to so it was a community people would move in into little huts to to till the land and um it was an incredible idea quashed 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 to read about how that happens, to read about the beginnings of um, of newspapers in the way that we would recognise them, um, with adverts and um, as well as, of course, the propaganda. Um, yeah. Anyway, this book absolutely fascinating, and um, Anarchy, uh, the the author, actually goes in uh, to it in the beginning as to why she. Um, she looked at the book and it was an ignorance and, and, and I'm not saying this disparagingly because I, I think there is a general ignorance as to what actually those 11 years um, without a monarch looked like. Um, so, yeah. Um, so Lottie Ray says, I think what unfolded wasn't what people who Cromwell manipulated into supporting him were anticipating. And of course, Cromwell wasn't necessarily the leader. He, he wasn't the head um, for a very long time of the movement so anyway you can see i'm waxing lyrical because i i really think this is a great book and i think it actually should be um uh i think it should be reading in schools i honestly do i think it's really really good i'd love to get anna on i'd love to interview anna so i, I might see if i can um okay we have six books down are you with me still people mm. my tea's gone cold i must have been speaking a lot right now, this is a book I'm putting forward because I don't have any... <laughs> I love to raise you sold it to me. <laughs> um, I, by the way, I don't get... Uh, I have in this pile... I don't think any of these books I haven't... Oh, one of these books I haven't bought myself. <laughs> but I, I just... I buy the books. Um, I don't know anything about this. And this is why I want to put this, forward this book. It's called Royal Renegades, The Children of Charles I, and the English Civil Wars by Linda Porter. Um, and yeah, because I don't know much about it. 
or other than there was a lot of illegitimate children. Thank you. Esther Wonder likes my tea mug. I like bees. Everything's to do with, with bees. I have a little pot in the back with a little bee on it. Um, yeah, because, so yes, um, I don't know much other than there's a lot of illegitimate children in uh, coming out of the children of Charles the First. Coming out of, sorry, I don't mean that literally. Um, and the uh, havoc that that caused. So um, yeah. Anyway, so that's what I can't say much about it because I haven't read it. But Linda Porter's uh, Royal Renegades, The Children of Charles I and the English Civil Wars, um, I'm interested in. Now we're getting on to the hardbacks. I think all of these, no, one of them I think is probably in paperback now. So <laughs> someone's going to be very happy when I said this. Um, oh, Melissa, had, oh, Melissa, it's okay. Crazy day, just relax with us for for the next 10 or 15 minutes we're discussing books so we have we've done 10 we've got five to go okay so these are all the uh, uh as i've said to those of you who've been with me all the time but these are the candidates the long list for book club next year for book club 2024 but i thought it, people might find it um interesting to go through them and why i've picked them because you might be looking for your next history read now there's this thing, isn't there, at the moment, how often do you think about the Roman Empire, which apparently now Kat tells me is um, something to do with something else. But anyway, I literally think about the Roman Empire <laughs> um, uh, on a daily basis uh, because I love it, because I'm developing a tour uh, about Rome and Britain and because there are some incredible books out there at the moment. Tom Holland, I was very fortunate to go and listen to him speak at the Gloucester History Festival, which is a fantastic festival if you can ever get to it. They do an autumn and they do a spring one. Um, his book is called Pax and it's War and Peace in Roman's Golden Age. Um, now, I will fully admit that the Roman Empire is something that I am, I mean, I'm just all in at the moment, but it of course is as long as it is wide as it is deep um it is fascinating now i'm just i'm learning things so this this is also on audible by the way um <laughs> she wrote i felt so called out by how often do you think about the roman empire because it's very often for me for me um yeah well it's it's interesting it's so it's it's um and we well, we can see a lot of it still. We um, are we use a lot of the language that came out of it, um, and we can see from what happened, what they did. We can see uh, how a you could use the word empire, but I think it's a society that grows and goes through various ways of trying to to um to organize itself uh with and, and how and how a successful system might turn into an unsuccessful one over time because things change um but in this book uh tom um covers as well the um the the the, the move into 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 britain um the uh move into scotland they went much farther into scotland than i had realized before retreating back and hadrian ordered the wall um so yeah i find this this book is is um is a really great insight into into roman britain but also what was happening in the empire and the impact it had um and just generally as well, how a society that grew so huge um, managed itself um, or not. And of course, eventually um, dissolved, disbanded. Although not as quickly as I thought, but that's something I need to go into. Um, but yes, as an aside, this isn't on the list, but I did get sent... I did get sent this book 
though I will mention it because I got I did get sent this one for free. Um, so I'm very uh, I'm very excited. I was very excited to get the um, the email saying, "Would you like? Would you like? Would I like a copy of Mary Beard's latest book? I mean, she is a hero. She is a hero. Um, it's called Emperor of Rome." And she goes, uh, well, I'm, I'm, you can see I'm, I'm that far in. I'm only really that far in so far. Um, but she talks about the Empress of Rome what's, uh, and, and, and the myths around them, what they did do, what they didn't do. Um, anyways, I'll, I'll mention that because uh, I have got sent that. It's another Roman one. Okay. The next ones. This is brand, brand new. I wasn't going to buy it. Well, I didn't know about it. <laughs> That's why I wasn't going to buy it. And then I saw it in a shop and I was like, ooh, I feel like I need to. Now, I don't particularly need another book on Anne Boleyn and Henry VIII, I have to say. But this is this is called Hunting the Falcon, Henry VIII, Anne Boleyn and the Marriage that Shook Europe. And the reason I have picked it up is because it's written by John Guy and Julia Fox. I haven't read it yet. I literally got this two days ago. If They've written a book. I want to assume that there's something in here new and interesting. I will be mortally disappointed if I don't learn anything new. So I'm going to reserve judgment on this one. If anyone has read it already, um, let me know. If you want, if you want to wait until I've read it to um, to decide, I will let you know my honest opinion on it. I do think books are an investment. They cost money. Especially if you're buying in hardback, you're talking £30 for this book. So anyway, so um, John and Julia, I'm a nobody, but I am expecting <laughs> I'm expecting some good stuff in this book. Um, oh, Linda says, just listen to a podcast on it. Fascinating. It focuses on Anne in France. Now, that would be good. That would be good um, because it's like, yeah, she went off to France. And then she came back. And then full stop. Uh, I think it might have had a bit more of an impact on her than just learning French. Um, Jenna says, I have this one on my list. I'm interested in knowing how it is. Yes. Me too. Me too. Now, this one is a bit of a blast from the past. Oh, Melissa's asking. Um, Alf, uh, Alf, Elfrith is the real name of Elfrida. Yes. Um, yeah. So it's, um, it's good. This one. Yanina Ramirez's book um, on the private lives of the saints. So it's called Power, Passion and Politics in Anglo-Saxon England. So we're back to Anglo-Saxon England. Um, so more specifically, I suppose, and it has been a little while since I've read this, but how Christianity um, came into, into England um, through the people. So these, these saints that, you know, they're legendary, but they're real people. They're real people, and and she goes into their stories. So it gives you an insight into the people. It gives an insight into Christianity being adopted in the country, what, what actually happened. Um, and uh, where they did it, what's left of, of what they did. Um, uh, some of the uh, legends, uh, legends, I don't know if legends is the right word, but that we still have today um you know best um uh the, 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 sorry that come from from this well how come our patron say to saint george there's she's got a few more candidates in here that really it's, it's interesting why they're not our patron say but anyway so there's that one i really like this one i might give this one a second read even if we don't pick it for um the book club okay two two down two more two more to go now, another Anne Boleyn one because Tracy Borman. If Tracy's written a book, I just I want to I want to read it, and um, I haven't read this one yet. I will tell you, I have listened to Tracy speak though uh, on on this book. She is um, she was um, she came and spoke to my Anne Boleyn group um, at Hampton Court Palace during our tour. So I have listened to her talk. It is fascinating. So of course I got I got the book. Um, so Anne Boleyn and Elizabeth I, the mother and daughter who changed history. And they, um, so she's talking about how um, 
you know what what was the what are the links between them um and anyway like i say i'm only i'm only so far into it at the moment so I, um but i i need i need to read quicker is what i need i need eyes that work better <laughs> eyes are crap eyes are crap it doesn't make reading very useful very easy um brianna says tracy borman is an automatic yes yeah and the audio book on Anne Elizabeth is great. Oh, yeah, I could do it on audio. That's a very good, uh, that's a good shout. Okay, last one. Now, this one is also, if he writes a book, it's an automatic yes. I know I am. You may say I'm slightly biased because he is a friend and he is my uh, co-host, well, he's my, co my tour historian when we go um, on tour, but wow as a writer and a historian gareth russell's book on the palace 500 years basically of history of hampton court palace and it um it, oh david says hunting the falcon gets released in australia in january so thank you david because one of the things i'll say is um uh if someone if if books are being released different times uh, but it's chosen it's it's chosen what i will do is i'll order the books um throughout the year so that people have the most well so that people can get hold of them clearly before we do the um before we do the meeting on a, on it okay so anyway so gareth's uh, book the palace 500 years so it's called from the tudors to the windsors 500 years of history at hampton court palace the it, gareth manages if you've read his Titanic book, you'll know this. Um, he manages to weave in the history of the country, what's going on through his narrative about. So in the Titanic example, the, the, the ship, literally, who was on it, who was building it, um, who designed it. The palace, I found really um, similar like that. In, it, you, you get an insight into the what, yeah, what was going on in the country through 500 years it's incredible how many stories linked back to Hampton Court Palace I flippantly said earlier about Cromwell um, Oliver Cromwell having Hampton Court Palace as his uh, weekend home hence it's surviving um, that's out of this book that's out of Gareth's book um uh yeah Waterstones have Lottie Rose um yeah Waterstones have highlighted um Gareth's book and he is, he's a wonderful um, storyteller. So any, anything that he writes is always, always worth a look. Um, what did he also put? Oh, he also uh, writes from the very beginning. And so it's full of stuff that you won't have heard of. Well, by the way, if somebody has come out with it suddenly in the past few weeks, it's because they've read his book and not, uh, not um, uh, credited him. So there are things like the fact that he starts off with um, as far back as the reign of Elizabeth I, staff were supplementing their income by offering tours to visitors. And the fascination uh, shows no signs of dwindling, of course, talking about the uh, the, um, uh, the visitors that go to Hampton Court Palace uh, every year. I, I mean, I knew it. I, we, we know from Jane Austen and um, Pride of Prejudice that, that, that people in the Georgian period are um are having tours of houses and the the staff left there are um are um uh, supplementing their income by doing it but of course i didn't realize it went as far back as the elizabethan era so i thought that was um fascinating um jenna i'm going to order the palace from blackwells yeah oh yeah no so it, so sorry excuse me yes the palace by gareth is uh, released um everywhere by December. I think December is the last release date. And that is, of course, so he can, I'll say, of course, that is so that he can do um, um, tours, uh, you know, talks and actually go to the US to do a bit of a book tour. So that is, um, that's very exciting if you can get to want to see him as well. Obviously, if you're on tour with me, you get to spend the whole few days with him, which is good, which is very good. OK, everyone, we are actually almost exactly on the hour. So if you're a member of my patron, you are, of course, then automatically uh, a member of the book club. If you're not, being a patron is only five pounds a month. Book club is just one of the things we, we do. Um, it's Patreon 
facebook.com forward slash British history and the voting for our, um, our list for 2024 in book club will go live straight after we finish here now. So if you want more live stuff, though, I will be back tonight with the History After Dark Girls with um, Dr. Kat and uh, Catherine Ibbotson. Uh, and we will be discussing, it's V tonight, we're in, a, we're in the, um, the dying stages of our Deceased Gits series. Uh, we're doing a Deceased Gits series for 2023. We're on V and we are talking about Princess Victoria of Saxe-Coburg. This is Queen Victoria's mother. And uh, yeah, it's going to be a fun discussion. I can tell you, I already know. Um, right, everybody, thank you so much for joining me. And uh, I'll see you either tonight if you're going to join History After Dark, which is history.after.dark on Instagram. And I think it's just History After Dark on, on YouTube. Um, you can find us there. And uh, we are live at 8.15 p.m. So if I don't see you there tonight, hopefully I'll see you here again same time next week. Um, in the meantime, take care, have fun, um, get your Amazon, no, not Amazon, I shouldn't say Amazon, your book orders in, to, with, try a local bookshop, see if you can get a local bookshop to get your books in for you. Um, right, everyone, thank you so much for that, and take care. All right, bye-bye.